So I apologise for my slides up front, which are not all that fancy in terms of uh, visuals. There's a lot of data, but I will go through it and explain it as carefully as I can. So we're talking about two things, which are related. So when you go to the pub and have a drink, often you have a packet of salty crisps. Um, so I'm going to actually talk about alcohol and salt. So the first one we're going to talk about alcohol, and alcohol really drives the um, medical profession crazy because there is a lot of strong data that suggests drinking alcohol is beneficial for your health, small amounts of alcohol. Um, a lot of medicos still don't believe that, and they still believe that the data is, is a bit corrupt, but probably it's true, although it's very hard to prove that. So if we look at people with type 2 diabetes specifically and alcohol, so we know that if you look at um, these cohort studies, so basically you, you gather up 100,000 people, you get them to fill in all sorts of questionnaires about what they eat and what they do, and then you watch them over the next 20 years to see what diseases they get and what they die from, and you might repeat some of these prescriptions. So much of the information that we've got in medicine comes from, especially nutritional medicine, comes from these kinds of studies, which are just observational rather than interventions. So if you put together some, some cohorts that have been observed for many years, what you find is a little bit of alcohol reduces your risk of heart disease and reduces total mortality. So you actually die at a lower rate overall. As soon as your alcohol goes up, you start to get more cancer, so the total mortality is not reduced. But heart disease is still reduced. So this particular paper looked at uh, total and uh, heart disease, and it was certainly reduced, but total mortality was only reduced at less than six grams of alcohol today. So one standard drink, one 100 ml glass of wine contains about 10 grams of alcohol. So one of those every two days, and your risk of dying is reduced to a small degree, something of the order of 15 to 20%. A cup, a drink a day to two drinks a day will reduce your risk of getting a, having a heart attack. And that's true in diabetics and true in non-diabetics. Um, and certainly, the other data from this study in America, the health professionals, where they recruited a lot of dentists and observed them for the next uh, 20 years, that actually drinking alcohol protects you from getting type 2 diabetes. Um, so there is benefit in, in two, two arms there. Um, if you are a modest alcohol drinker, so say men, two drinks, two standard drinks a day, but you have episodes on the weekend where you have a big bit of a binge, which is not unknown for males, and Young girls these days do it as well. We have five, six, seven, eight, ten drinks. So if you do that, you completely wipe any benefit of the alcohol. Um, and of course, if you do that episodically, then you actually increase your risk of both heart disease and cancer um, quite significantly. So alcohol is good in very, very small amounts, tiny amounts. What about control of your sugar? So if you have got type 2 diabetes, what does it do to your sugar control? Now you might think you're eating extra calories from the uh, alcohol and from the stuff you put the alcohol with and that your HbA1c might be a bit higher. So this other observational study comes from a Kaiser Permanente Health uh, Group in California. So it has, uh, in this particular study, so 36,000 diabetics on their, their books. And what they found was that there was a direct relationship between how much they drank and a lower HbA1c. So although your doctor might say to you, you know, don't drink so much alcohol, especially if your uh, HbA1c is poorly controlled. In fact, this study says that uh, two drinks a day, actually you have a slightly lower HbA1c than the, those people that don't drink. And there was quite a strong relationship in this observational. Now this brings out part of the problem and why nutritional advice is so messy and why um, in the public People get very confused because the data, new studies keep coming out and having different answers, is that when you do an intervention and get people to drink alcohol and see what it does to your HbA1c, it doesn't change it. So we've got evidence on one hand that says drinking a bit of alcohol lowers your HbA1c, yet when you intervene in a group of people with type 2 diabetes and give them alcohol, HbA1c doesn't move at all. So, it brings up the problem that happens in all of these studies and why the public are confused and why physicians and GPs are confused is that um, these observational studies are what's called confounded. So people that have a healthy lifestyle, so they might eat a lot of fruit and vegetables and uh, high fibre and have a lower rate of disease, but they also do a lot of other things different from people that don't eat those kind of things. 
So you might say, yes, it looks like eating fruit and vegetables and eating lots of fibre is really good for you, but it's hard to prove. And the people that do that walk more, smoke less, generally have a much healthier lifestyle. So it's been really hard to tease them out. So when you do an intervention and you expect to see that drinking alcohol will lower your HbA and c it doesn't. So maybe it doesn't help drinking alcohol to lower your HbA and c Um, this, was, this was a short study with 18 uh, people with type 2 diabetes and basically nothing much happened. So when they did an acute, so there's alcohol on one day and then juice, um, grape juice on the other day and you can see the curves overlay each other. So it doesn't really make any difference to your profile of glucose over the day, whether you're having grape juice or whether you're having alcohol. It doesn't, doesn't make it better, doesn't make it worse. So this interesting study called the Cascade study really tried to do a very hard study. I would have thought an impossible study is to randomise people that are drinkers, quite happy to drink, to no alcohol for two years or alcohol for two years. So it's a Feb fast for two years, which I don't think I could ever manage to do. I mean, doing a Feb fast is bad enough, which I'm doing at the moment, but no alcohol for two years. So they were randomised. So they had 224 people and they did it in um, a workplace setting in the Negev desert in a nuclear reactor in, in Israel. And there were some other collaborators as well. 150 mils of water, all red wine or white wine, over two years. Because they only had a small number of people, 224, that's not enough people to see whether you have heart, more heart attacks or more disease. So what they did was try to look at the blood vessels and see what they looked like under ultrasound. Um, and at the end of two years, not much happened. So drinking that alcohol made no difference whatsoever. There's no benefit, which is very sad. No benefit from red wine, no benefit from white wine. It didn't make it worse, which is an important thing, but it certainly didn't improve it. So again, you've got this tension all the time between what you observe in these cohort studies where you're watching people over years and years and say, well, oh, they're dying less, they're getting less heart attacks, less disease when they drink alcohol. Do a study, a really hard study, for two years and you don't find any benefit at all. So what is the answer? I don't think anybody really knows. Apart from alcohol is probably not harmful in small doses. Now whether it's good, I just don't know. And in this particular um, subset, they looked at their blood pressure, they looked at how much fat they put on, um, and they found that the blood pressure didn't go up with alcohol, which goes against just about every study that you've ever seen where you stop uh, alcohol in people uh, that are usually big drinkers, their blood pressure falls. We know that giving people alcohol puts their blood pressure up, which makes it even more surprising that uh, there's protection from heart disease because blood pressure is very strongly related to heart disease. So some people said, oh, well, it's not the alcohol per se that's beneficial, it's the polyphenols, which is the, the, red, the red colour basically and the bitter flavours in, in grapes and many other fruit and vegetables. But of course, when you test the, the red bit without the alcohol, no effect on blood pressure either. So it's not the, not the red stuff, it's not the polyphenols in red wine that improves. Um, the only good thing you can say about alcohol in the health professionals, which are obviously a group of people that take care of their health and are not at all like the average person, that their weight didn't change. So although there's calories in alcohol, over the 24 years of the study, their weight didn't change comparing drinkers to non-drinkers. There was this very large study in America called the Look Ahead Study. People with type 2 diabetes, and what they were trying to prove was that losing weight will actually prevent heart attacks and reduce the mortality. So again, a very challenging kind of study. So they had thousands and thousands of people with type 2 diabetes. So they put on an intensive lifestyle intervention where they lost weight, they exercised, and to get into the study, you actually had to be able to exercise. So it's a very select subset again. What they found was that if you were a heavy drinker in this study, a consistently heavy drinker, they lost less. The people who did that lost less weight than those that didn't. So that's not really a surprise because you know from your own personal experience when you drink alcohol, your inhibitions get a bit loosened in many different ways, but particularly around food. So you tend to eat more than if you don't drink alcohol. So in this particular study where people were being encouraged to, to lose weight and getting a lot of support, if you're a heavy drinker, you lost less weight. And even if you're only a little drinker, there was still a difference between the non-drinkers and the drinkers in terms of how much weight you can lose. So if you want to lose weight, drinking alcohol is probably not a good idea um, for the reasons we discussed in terms of keeping control of your inhibitions. <coughs> 
and keeping control of your food intake. A little bit of alcohol, if everything goes out the window. And of course, the other big problem about alcohol is all the alcohol-related diseases. So I mentioned cancer goes up um, as you drink alcohol, and even a small amount of alcohol, you'll get more cancers all the way down your GI tract. And of course, liver disease, cirrhosis is a big thing in terms of alcohol intake, usually high alcohol intake. So if you've got type 2 diabetes and it's not so well controlled, you'll tend to have a fatty liver. So the, the good news from this study was that there was no difference between drinkers and non-drinkers in terms of how much fat they had in their liver. But of course, the drinkers had more fibrosis, so they're on their way to cirrhosis. So again, um, even modest alcohol intake, particularly in type 2 diabetes, is, encourages more fibrosis in the liver. So you're heading towards cirrhosis. So again, that's quite a, a you know, big black mark against alcohol, despite the positive epidemiology that says there's lower mortality. So that's alcohol. And as you can see, you know, the data is very messy. So yes, there's protection, but there's lots of things that alcohol can do. So maybe one glass of any kind of alcohol a couple of times a week. And one glass is 100 mils, not the 150 mils that you get served in a, a restaurant. 100 mils is one standard glass. If you have a couple of those a week, you're probably not doing yourself any harm. And there's a chance that you may be doing yourself some good. But I'm not entirely convinced, because you can't actually prove any benefit when you feed people alcohol at all. So if you thought alcohol was complicated, then let's get to salt. <laughs> which is even more complicated. And people have been studying salt for years and years and years. And there are these huge salt wars that rage, particularly in America, between the pro-salt and the anti-salt, as to is there any benefit in reducing your salt intake? So we all know we have a large amount of salt, mostly in processed food. Um, and that in some countries, like in China and Japan, they have a huge amount of salt. And it is associated with strokes. But the, the question that hasn't been answered is if you reduce your salt intake, do you get any benefit? So somebody put together 34 trials. So that's 3,000 odd people that have been in trials lowering their salt intake. And you know as soon as you lower your salt intake, your blood pressure will go down. And that's been proven again and again and again and again. So you'd think if your blood pressure is going to go down, you should have less heart attacks. Not so simple. Not so simple at all. It, it is very hard to prove that that happens and lots of people are convinced it doesn't happen. So certainly, if you lower your salt intake by four grams, so on average in the community, we would be having seven to 11 grams of salt a day, mostly from processed food. So if you halve it, say, which is a big change, really difficult change for most people to do, a huge change, your blood pressure will go down four millimeters systolic, two millimeters diastolic. You say, well, that's not all that much, which is true, not for an individual. But when you do that across, sorry, do that across hundreds of thousands of people, you know, you get a little reduction in the stroke rate from that lower blood pressure, then there'll be a lot fewer strokes in the community or a lot fewer heart attacks, in theory. Um, and the most important thing, of course, in your response to your blood pressure and salt is age. So the older you are, the more you respond. If you've already got high blood pressure, you respond quite dramatically to a salt reduction. Uh, and certain ethnic groups. So if you're Indian, um, Middle Eastern, you'll tend to respond more to the salt reduction than if you're white. But when you reduce salt, there's all sorts of molecules in the body that go up in response to this salt reduction, things that you've never heard of and will never hear of again, renin and all the which are all involved in salt balance. Um, and the triglyceride might go up and the cholesterol might also go up as well. So there are things that happen in response to this salt reduction which are not so good. So aldosterone tends to make fibrosis um, in the heart. So the group of people that say salt is really important estimate that, say, looking at the American data, 700 odd thousand people died from heart attacks and strokes and type two diabetes every year. And they calculated that high salt intake was the most important factor amongst all the other factors they looked at in your diet. About 10% of deaths were attributable to having a high salt intake, which was really um, average kind of salt intake versus a very low salt intake. So those 
uh, authors would be convinced that salt is a very important factor, but no one has actually really proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that lowering your salt intake actually does make you live longer, gives you fewer heart attacks, fewer strokes. Certainly if you've got type 2 diabetes and reduce your salt intake, your blood pressure will fall. So there was 13 studies with only 250 people with type 2 diabetes, so a very understudied group. And there need to be a lot more studies in people with type 2 diabetes. Um, so your blood pressure will drop 7 on 3 millimetres. So probably be twice that of a person without type 2 diabetes for, a ve again, a very large reduction in, in sodium. If they looked at people with type 1 diabetes and tried to relate their complication to their salt intake, there was certainly more kidney disease, uh, more proteinuria, um, if your salt intake was high. So it's suggested in these people, who are about 40 and obviously had diabetes for 20 odd, 30 years, that you're more likely to have kidney disease with a high salt intake. And it was more likely to be worse if you're overweight, uh, which is certainly happening in people with type 1. They're gradually increasing in weight with time. But it only happened in people with high blood pressure or heart disease. It didn't actually happen if you had none of these diseases. So what the cohort studies which I talked about where most of our data comes from are very conflicted. So at least in alcohol, they don't conflict. They all say a little bit of alcohol is good when you put them together. Whereas with salt and type 2 diabetes and heart disease and stroke, you have cohort studies that say one thing, cohort studies that say the other, and cohort studies that are right in the middle. So if you're looking at it as a professional or as a consumer, it's hard to make any sense of it at all. So we go to Finland. So basically, if you had a high salt intake, you can double your risk of getting type 2 diabetes. So salt seems to be important in getting type 2 diabetes. And if you've got a high salt intake, you have an increase in heart disease. Uh, with something like a 50% increase. And you also have a higher mortality from this high salt intake. So that's one set of data you say, okay, well that sounds like salt's really bad. <coughs> then you have this whole bunch of studies that all have these fancy names, 133,000 people, half of whom had high blood pressure. And what they found was that yes, if you had a really high salt intake, the mortality was higher, but if you had a low salt intake, mortality was higher. So this is really throws the throws the, the world into total confusion. And this is really low salt intake, half of what you and I would consume. So quite low. Um, and the, the high salt intake was associated with heart disease only if you had high blood pressure. If you didn't have high blood pressure, high salt did nothing to you, but low salt killed you at twice the rate. <laughs> And, there, and these risks were only seen in countries that had a normal high salt intake, like Australia. So people have been trying, you thought doing an alcohol study and getting people to take no alcohol for two years is hard. Doing a, a low salt intervention and then following people for long enough to see a reasonable rate of heart attacks and strokes and, and deaths is a very, very difficult thing to do. And there haven't been that many trials. So these American trials were done in the 60s called Trials of Hypertension Prevention. And they are very intensive. They required a lot of people. So people were collecting their wee around the clock. Because that's the only way you can really know how much salt people are eating, is by collecting your wee and measuring it in the wee. And it's a 24 hour you've got to do. Anything else is no good. And a lot of that other data um, was just spot urine in the morning, which is a bit unreliable. Anyway, so they had large numbers of people followed for 10 or 15 years. And because people that volunteer for trials are really healthy, we never capture the people that are unwell that are going to die tomorrow, because that makes the trials very difficult, of course. So you have a bunch of healthy people, you try to get them to reduce their salt intake and keep that salt intake low year after year, which is really hard, because every food that you buy in the supermarket has got salt in it. So all you can do is have, you know, a bit of meat and, and green leafy vegetables and nothing else pretty much because there's salt everywhere. So your favourite bit of cheese, no, nope, can't have that, that's got salt. So you can imagine it's really hard to get people to sign up to these trials and to stick to them. So the they, salt reduction in the end is about a gram a day. So not a huge amount of salt reduction. So you're not going to expect exciting events. So in this particular one, 
the trials of hypertension prevention, they did find that when you got down to a low salt intake, you didn't die more often. You actually got benefit. So unlike all the other cohort studies which said low salt is really bad, these trials said low salt is not really bad and you actually get benefit. But the number of events were very small. So the number of heart attacks, the number of strokes, very small. And there were a lot of dropouts, not surprising, because people just cannot stick to being on a low salt diet year after year. They give up or they crib here and there. Anyway, so in this particular study, there was no suggestion of a, a U-shape or a J-shape curve. It was bad one way or bad the other way. What they did was, and the best estimate, um, and this is one way around the salt conundrum, is that another salt that we have, potassium, potassium chloride is beneficial. Sodium chloride is, is harmful. Puts your blood pressure up, potassium puts your blood pressure down. So if you do the ratio of sodium, potassium, and potassium get, comes from fruit and vegetables. So if you do the ratio of salt to potassium, you get the best estimate of your risk of heart disease. So in this particular one, it was a nice steady rise. So the more sodium you had in relation to the amount of potassium you're eating, there was harm. And there was no evidence of worsening on the other end of the curve. Now we have some nice conflicting data from Australia. So the um, Diabetes Clinic, the Austin, which is a very comprehensive diabetes clinic, has been getting its patients to do 24-hour urines, often three or four or five through the time they're attending the clinic. They have high sodium excretion, 184 millimoles a day, which is exactly what you and I consume if we have normal food. So that the people there were no different from the average consumers. And they followed them for 10 years, and there were 175 deaths. And what they found was that there was no level of sodium that caused harm. In fact, the more sodium you had, the lower your death rate. <laughs> Completely opposite of many of the other studies. And there's, they couldn't explain it at all. And this is a well-followed, well-looked-after um, well group. This curve is probably going to be a little bit hard for you to see, but the death rate is 0.4. So if you've got a very low sodium excretion, which is the fifth percentile, so you're down at the bottom of sodium excretion, your death rate there is 0.4, and if you look if you're at the top, really high, it's 0.2 um, over 10 years. So halving of your death rate if you have a high sodium excretion in this group of type 2 diabetes. So explain that. But they couldn't explain it either, but it's, it's an observation. And then another study from Finland, this was people with type 1. And again, they followed them for 10 years, 270 people died. So this time it was non linearly associated, which means it was a J or a U-shaped curve, which I'll show you. So you can see that curve at the top. So yes, if your sodium intake goes up, as measured by excretion, you have more heart attacks and more deaths and more renal failure. But you can see on the other side, for those people that are with low sodium excretion, for whatever reason, maybe they're too sick to eat any foods at all. No one really knows. Death rate goes up remarkably. So we're in this, the sweet spot really. You can see 150 to 200, which is about where we fall. It's pretty flat. So we're actually probably doing okay. And if we have a really vast sodium intake up on that end, with like the Chinese and the Japanese, you get more strokes. And if you have a really low sodium intake, for whatever reason, and we don't know why, then your mortality goes up dramatically. So you can see for a physician to try to make sense of all of this data and advise the patients with their hand on the heart, say this is really true, is very, very difficult. So you can probably say, you know, getting your sodium from 200 to 100 won't do you any harm, might do you some good, but lower than that we really have no idea. And if you're really a big sodium excreter and a sodium intake, then lowering it towards 100 to 150, which is where we are, might be a good idea. So what about intervention? So I mentioned the trials of hypertension prevention. That was one particular group. Then there was a meta-analysis, which is where they put together all the studies that have ever been done, which are not a lot. So Hay and McGregor uh, did this, and they said, we think if you go on a low-salt diet, heart attacks and strokes go down. But total deaths don't go down, non-significantly. Uh, and the reduction in salt intake was 2 to 2 2 to 2.3 grams a day, so a modest reduction again. But that's probably all you can ever really maintain long term. Uh, 
Unfortunately, when they put these studies together, they excluded one of the studies, which was a heart failure study. So they found that patients who had already had heart failure, if they lowered their salt intake, their death rate went up, like some of those J curves I showed you. So they excluded that one. If they'd left it in, nothing would have happened. So the, the proof that clinicians have that telling anybody to go on a low salt diet, unless they've got an extreme salt intake, like in China and Japan, it's just not there. Now, there, there is a trial that's happening in China at the moment, trying to reduce Chinese salt intake and see whether strokes are reduced. And we don't know the answers to that. And that'll be clear that if you've got a really high sodium intake and you reduce it, we'll be able to see whether it reduces stroke. I think in our community, our sodium intake is just not high enough to be, and it's hard to reduce it, that we'll ever see a clear answer. So this inter-heart study just looked at people's dietary patterns and looked at heart attacks um, across the world. And there were two factors that came out, intake of fatty foods, fried fatty foods, and intake of salty foods. So in this particular one, it looked like worldwide that salt was related to heart attacks. So we have, this is um, all the studies put together. So we've got studies on the left, those little bottom three that say lowering your salt intake reduces your rate of disease. These three on the right say lowering your salt intake increases your risk of heart disease. And the ones in the middle that give you a J-shaped curve. So the evidence is just spread far and wide. And I'll just show you what we've been doing, trying to answer this question. So because doing a low salt intervention is incredibly difficult, and having enough people and following people for long enough to have enough heart attacks and strokes. Um, it's, they're very hard studies and very expensive studies to do. So we were looking at trying to look at intermediate. So people have been looking at lowering your blood pressure, but of course that's never been proven to then translate into lower strokes and lower heart attacks, which you'd expect it would. So we looked at a thing called flow meter dilatation, which is a, your artery in the arm, it's called the brachial artery. So you can get a nice ultrasound and you can visualize it like this. So you can see the edges of the artery. And what we do is put a blood pressure cuff on it and make your arm go white and numb. And uh, it's quite uncomfortable, but most people can cope with it right. And then after five minutes, you release the cuff. And in response to that ischemia in your arm, the blood flow goes up enormously. So it goes up tenfold. And you get this big flush of blood in your hand. Now, if you've got a nice, healthy artery, the artery says, hey, yay, there's blood rushing through, and it gets bigger, so you can measure it. You can see this one, um, it's gone up about 10% or so. So you can actually measure that quite easily on the ultrasound. And that's a good reflection of blood vessel health. So we thought, can we influence FMD, this dilatation of the blood vessel with salt? Um, and that would give us a clue that actually salt does have an, uh, a, a role to play. And this FMD we know is related to all the risk factors for heart disease. So you tend to have a lower value, less dilatation. If you're overweight, if you've got type two diabetes, if you smoke, if you're high cholesterol, and this molecule called nitric oxide, which was the molecule of the year 25 years ago or something. So it's a gas. So the lining of the artery releases this gas and it goes through to the muscle and makes it relax. Uh, and that's the mechanism of this thing that we measure. And when you've got all these risk factors for heart disease, this gas production is reduced. And it's an independent predictor of heart disease. So people that have low FMD are much more likely to get heart disease. And there's many, many studies that show that. So what we did was we took people on an average kind of salt intake, nine grams a day, 150 millimoles, and we reduced them to 50 millimoles, which was a drastic reduction. So we only got them to do it for two weeks so they could cope with that. Uh, and then we measured their FMD um, before and after. And that's their salt intake. So we measured their salt in their urine. So it went down on the low salt, up on the uh, normal salt. And their FMD was much higher on the low salt diet compared to the normal salt. So we could actually influence the behavior of the blood vessel with salt. So at least looking at this, it suggested going on a low salt diet will make your blood vessels behave better. And we know that this factor which we measure, the flow meter dilatation, is actually beneficial and relates to heart disease risk. So it was a 45% improvement. So 
the salt seemed to have the same kind of value as taking a statin in terms of improvement of your blood vessel um, and or blood pressure medication. And then we thought, if you go to the McDonald's and have a lot of chips with salt or go and have a Chinese meal, um, what would that big load of salt do? So we gave people a huge load of salt and it was a very salty drink, so I had several of them and several of these tests. And the FMD after that meal dropped. So you can see the blue one is what happens to a meal, a soup, it was a tomato soup, uh, without salt. And then when you added salt, it dipped a lot more. So it got a lot worse. So it suggests just having one single high salt meal wasn't good for your blood vessels. So what is happening in terms of salt? So in the UK, there's been a public health campaign quite strong, and they managed to reduce uh, intake by one gram from nine grams down to eight grams. So not at all anywhere near that really low salt level where the mortality goes up dramatically. So it's predicted that will have beneficial effects in terms of health, but we don't know whether it will or not. So the salt that you see, that you sprinkle on, which many people don't do these days, is probably only 15% uh, of people, 15% of your salt intake. Um, and natural salts in some foods, 10%, and all the rest is in processed food. So bread, biscuits, cakes, cheese, etc. Um, so the only way of reducing your salt intake is to reduce a lot of the intake of your processed foods. And over the last 20 years, there's been absolutely no change in our salt intake. So Trevor Beard in Hobart was really interested and keen about salt, and he measured salt intake 7 to 10 grams a day. Um, and when we were measuring at Syro, it was a very similar hadn't changed at all, despite you know, a lot of emphasis on salt. So people, uh, they may not be resistant to the idea of trying to lower their salt intake, but it's really hard to do, because it's everywhere. You don't taste it salty. You wouldn't think that bread has a large amount of salt and contributes. Um, so it's all hidden. So the only way it's going to change is for manufacturers to reduce the salt intake. So. The benefits of lowering salt intake dramatically in people with type 2 diabetes or people without type 2 is not clear at all, especially going to half of what we reduce eat today, you know, less than 100 millimoles. We really do not know whether that's beneficial. Going from 9 grams to 8 grams has happened in the UK probably is, but we don't know that for sure. So we need lots more studies, particularly in people with type 2 diabetes. So if you see an ad in the paper for a long-term study that requires people with type 2 diabetes, just put your hand up. Uh, you might have to be in the study for 10 years, but uh, put, your, put your hand up, because we need a lot more information. Okay.